chapter one of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org beyond these voices by mary elizabeth braddon chapter one lady felicia disbrow was supposed to condescend when she married captain cunningham of the first life since although his people lived on their own land and were handsomely recorded in burke there was no record of them before the conquest nor even on the muster roll of those who fought and died for the angevin kings captain cunningham was handsome and fashionable but not rich and when he had the bad luck to get himself killed in an egyptian campaign he left his widow with an only daughter seven years old her pension and a settlement that brought her about six hundred a year half of which came from the disbrows while the other half was the rental of three or four small farms in somersetshire it will be seen therefore that for a person who considered herself essentially grande dame and to whom all degrading economies must be impossible lady felicia's position was not enviable as the seven-year-old orphan grew in grace and beauty to sweet seventeen lady felicia began to consider her daughter her chief asset so lovely a creature must command the admiration of the richest bachelors in the marriage market she would have her choice of opulent lovers there would be no cruel necessity for forcing a marriage with vulgar wealth or drivelling age she would have her adorers among the best the fortunate the well-bred the young and handsome nor was lady felicia mistaken in her forecast when cara came out under the auspices of her aunt lady oakhampton she made a success that realized her mother's fondest dreams youth rank and wealth were at her feet there was no question of riches raked out of the gutter she had but to say the sweet little monosyllable yes and one of the best-born and best-looking men in london and town and country houses yacht and opera box would be hers and her mother would cease to be poor lady felicia unhappily before lord walford had time to offer her all these advantages cara had fallen in love with somebody else and that somebody was no other than lancelot davis the poet just then the petted darling of dowagers and of young married women whose daughters were in the nursery and who had therefore no fear of his fascinating personality unfortunately for lady felicia her head was too high in the air for her to take note of the literary stars who shone at luncheon parties and even when her daughter praised the young poet and tried to interest her mother in his latest book lady felicia took no alarm it was only in the beginning of their acquaintance that cara talked of the poet to her unresponsive mother by the time she had known him twenty days of that heavenly june he was far too sacred to be talked about to an unsympathetic listener it was only to her dearest and only bosom friend who was also in love with the adorable lancelot that cara liked to talk of him and to her she discoursed romantic nonsense that would have covered reams of foolscap had it been written lancelot she said in low thrilling tones even his name is a poem everything about him was a poem for cara his boots his tie his cane and especially his hair which he took a poet's privilege of wearing longer than fashion justified though educated at the stationer's school and unacquainted with either varsity nobody ever said of mr davis that he was not a gentleman that scathing irrevocable sentence with the cruel emphasis upon the negative had not been pronounced upon the man who wrote the new ariadne a work of genius which scared the lowly-minded country vicar his father and set his pious mother praying with trembling and tears that the eyes of her beloved son might be opened and that he might repent of using the talents god had given him in the service of satan 
lancelot davis had made up for the lack of varsity training by strenuous self-culture he was passionate exalted transcendental more swinburne than swinburne steeped in dante and victor hugo stuffed almost to choking with musset baudelaire and verlaine he was young handsome or rather beautiful too beautiful for a man paris leander the sun god anything you like and at the time of his wooing his pockets were full of the proceeds of a book that had made a sensation and he was the rage were not these things enough to fire the imagination and win the heart of a girl of eighteen half educated undisciplined the daughter of a shallow-brained mother who had never taken the trouble to understand her or taken account of the romantic yearnings in the mind of eighteen if lady felicia had cultivated her daughter's mind half as strenuously as she had cultivated her person the girl would have not been so ready to fall in love with her poet but the girl's home life had been an arid waste and the mother's conversation had been one long repining against the fate that had made her poor lady felicia and had deprived her of all the things that are needed to make life worth living lancelot davis opened the gates of an enchanted land in which money counted for nothing where there was no animosity against the ultra-rich no perpetual talk of debts and difficulties no moaning over the hardship of doing without things that luckier people could enjoy in abundance he led her into that lovely world where the imagination rules supreme he introduced her to other poets the gods of that enchanted land browning tennyson shelley byron she bowed down before these mighty spirits but thought lancelot davis greater than the greatest of them there was nothing mean or underhand about her poet's conduct he lost no time in offering himself to lady felicia he was not a pauper he was not ill-born and he was thought to have a brilliant future before him his suit was supported by some of poor felicia's oldest and best friends but lady felicia received his addresses with coldness and scarcely concealed contempt and she told her daughter that while she had committed an unpardonable sin when she refused lord walford were she to insist upon marrying mr davis it would be a heart-broken mother's duty to cast her off for ever i never could forgive you cara she said and she never did cara walked out of the weymouth street lodgings early one morning before lady felicia had rung for her meagre breakfast of chocolate and toast she carried her dressing-bag to the corner of the street where davis was waiting in a hansom her trunk with all that was most needful of her wardrobe had been dispatched to the station overnight labelled for the continental express there was plenty of time to be married before the registrar and to be at victoria ready for the train that was to carry them on the first stage of that wonderful journey which begins in the smoke and grime of south london and ends under the italian sky they went from the registrar's office straight to the lake of como and lived between bellagio and venice for four years years of ineffable bliss at the end of which sweet summer-time of love and life for it seemed never winter the girl-wife died leaving her young husband heartbroken with an only child a daughter three years old an incarnation of romantic love and romantic beauty when he carried off lady felicia's daughter the poet was at the top of his vogue and his vogue lasted for just those four years of supreme happiness nothing that he wrote after his wife's death had the old passion or the old music his genius died with his wife heartbroken and disappointed he became a consumptive and died of an open-air cure leaving piteous letters to lady felicia and his wife's other relations imploring them to take care of his daughter she would have the copyright of his 
five volumes of verse and two successful tragedies for her portion so she was not altogether without means lady felicia's heart was not all stone there was a vulnerable spot upon which the serpent's tooth had fastened obstinate proud and selfish she had never faltered in her unforgiving attitude towards the runaway daughter but when there came the sudden news of Carr's death a blow for which the spartan mother was utterly unprepared an agony of remorse disturbed the self-satisfied calm of a mind which thought itself justified in resenting injury perhaps she had pictured to herself a day upon which cara would have come back to her and sued for pardon and she would have softened and taken the prodigal daughter to her heart one of the girl's worst crimes had been that she had not knelt and wept and entreated to be forgiven before she took that desperate immodest and even vulgar step of a marriage before the registrar she had shown herself heartless as a daughter and how could she expect softness in her mother but she was dead she had passed beyond the possibility of pardon or love that vague dream of reconciliation could never be realized if there had been anything wrong in lady felicia's behaviour as a parent that wrong could never be righted never more would she see the lovely face that was to have brought prosperity and happiness for them both never more would she hear the sweet voice which the fashionable italian master had trained to such perfection the french ballads and jensen's setting of heine came out of the caverns of memory as lady felicia sat poor and lonely in a lodging-house drawing-room on the borderland of west end london the last possible street before w became n w ninon que fait tu de la vie memory brought back every tone of the fresh young voice lady felicia could hardly believe that there was no one singing that the room was empty of human life except her own fatigued existence that last year of remorseful memories softened her and she accepted the charge that lancelot davis left her he lived just long enough in his bleak hospital on a gloucestershire hilltop to read his mother-in-law's letter send the little girl to me i will be kinder to her than i was to her mother society and especially carr's other relations said that poor felicia had been quite admirable in taking the sole charge of the orphan there was no attempt to foist the little girl upon aunts and cousins and considering poor felicia's state of genteel pauperism always in lodgings her behaviour was worthy of all praise the grandchild brought back the memory of the daughter's childhood and lady felicia almost felt as if she was again a young widow full of care for her only child so far as her narrow means permitted she made the little girl happy and she found her own dreary existence brightened by that young life that calm and monotonous existence with granny was not the kind of life that childhood yearns for and there were long stretches of time in which little veronica had only her picture-books and fancy needlework to amuse her after the cheap morning governess had departed and the day's tasks were done at least granny did not torture the orphan with over-education a little french a little easy music a little english history occupied the morning hours and then vera was free to read what books she liked to choose out of granny's blameless and meagre library lady felicia's nomadic life had not allowed the accumulation of literature but the few books she carried about with her were of the best scott thackeray dickens byron her trunks had room only for the immortals and as soon as vera could read them and long before she could understand them those dear books were familiar to her the pictures helped her to understand and she was never tired of looking at them sometimes granny would read shakespeare to her the ghostly scenes in hamlet which thrilled her 
or passages and scenes from the tempest or midsummer night's dream which vera thought divine she had no playfellows and hardly knew how to play but in her lonely life imagination filled the space that the frolics and gambols of exuberant spirits occupy in the life of the normal child those few great novels which she read over and over again peopled her world a world of beautiful images that she had all to herself and of which her fancy never wearied amy robsart and leicester the scottish knight the generous saracen the heroic dog paul dombey and his devoted sister david copperfield and his child wife these were the companions of the long silent afternoons when granny was taking her siesta in seclusion upstairs and when vera had the drawing-room to herself no visitors intruded on those long afternoons for lady felicia's card gave the world to know that the first and fifteenth of may june and july were the only days on which she was accessible to the friends and acquaintances who had not utterly forgotten poor felicia's existence it was a life of monotony against which an older girl would have revolted but childhood is submissive and accepts its environment as something inevitable so vera made no protest against fate but there was one golden season in her young life one heavenly summer holiday in the west country when her aunt lady ockhampton happening to call upon lady felicia was moved to compassion at sight of the little girl pale and languid as she sat in the corner of the unlovely drawing-room with an open book on her lap this hot weather makes london odious said lady oakhampton we are all leaving much earlier than usual i suppose you and the little girl are soon going into the country no i shan't move till the end of october when we go to brighton as usual i have had invitations to nice places the helstons the her own moors but i can't take that child and i can't leave her poor little girl does she never see gardens and meadows brighton is only london with a little less smoke and a strip of grey water that one takes on trust for the sea wouldn't you like a country holiday veronica what a name she is always called vera her father was a poet lancelot davis yes i remember him and he gave her that absurd name because the italian hills were purple and white with the flower when she was born rather a nice idea well vera if granny likes you shall come to disbrow with your cousins and you shall have a real country holiday and come back to granny in september with rosy cheeks and bright eyes oh never to be forgotten golden days in which the child of eleven found herself among a flock of young cousins in a rural paradise where she first knew the rapture of loving birds and beasts she adored them all from the gold and silver pheasants in the aviary to the great slow wagon horses on the home farm and the shooting dogs among the children of the house and more masterful in his behaviour than any of them there was an eton boy of sixteen who was not a disbrow although he claimed cousinship in a minor degree he was a disbrow on the distaff side he told vera a distinction which he had to explain to her he was claude rutherford and he belonged to the yorkshire rutherfords who had been roman catholic from the beginning of history with which they claimed to be coeval he was in the upper sixth at eton and was going to oxford in a year or two and from oxford into the army he was a clever boy old for his years quoted omar khayyam in season and out of season and was already tired of many things that boys are fond of but superior as this young person might be he behaved with something more than cousinly kindness to the little girl from london whose pitiful story lady oakhampton had expounded to him he was familiar with the poetry of lancelot davis whose lyrics had a flavour of omar and he was pleased to patronise the departed poet's daughter 
he took vera about the home farm and the stables and introduced her to the assemblage of living creatures that made disbrow park so enchanting he taught her to ride the barb that had been his favourite mount four years earlier he seemed ages older than vera and he condescended to her and protected her and would not allow his cousins to tease her although their vastly superior education tempted them to make fun of the little girl who had only two hours a day from a miss walker and to whom the whole world of science was dark what a change was that large life at disbrow the picnics and excursions the little dances after dinner the run with the otter hounds on dewy mornings the rustic races and sports the thrilling jaunts with cousin claude in his dinghy over those blue-green west country waves a life so full of variety and delight that the pleasures of the day ran over into the dreams of night and sleep was a round of adventure and excitement what a change from the slow walk in regent's park or along the sea front at brighton beside granny's bath chair or the afternoon drive between hove and kemptown in a hired landau she thought of poor granny who was not invited to disbrow and was sorry to think of her lingering in the dull london lodging when all her friends had gone off to their cures in germany and austria and while it was still too early to migrate to the brighter rooms on the marine parade these happy days at disbrow were the first and last of their kind for though lady okehampton promised to invite her the following year there were hindrances to the keeping of that promise and she saw disbrow park no more life in london and brighton continued with what the average girl would have called a ghastly monotony till vera was sixteen when lady felicia after a bronchial attack of unusual severity was told that brighton was no longer good enough for her winters and if she wished to see any more december she must migrate to sunnier regions in the autumn can or mentone were suggested granny smiled a bitter smile at the mention of can she had stayed there with her husband at the beginning of their wedded life when she was young and beautiful and when captain cunningham was handsome and reckless they had been among the gayest and the best received and had tasted all that can could give of pleasure but they had spent a year's income in five weeks and had felt themselves paupers among the millionaire shipbuilders and exotic hebrews lady felicia decided on san marco a picturesque little spot on the italian riviera which had been only a fishing village till within the last ten years when an english doctor had discovered it and two or three hotels had been built to accommodate the patients he sent there the sea-front was sheltered from every pernicious wind and the sea was unpolluted by the drainage of a town peasant proprietors grew their carnations all along the shore close to the sandy beach and the olive woods that clothed the sheltering hill were carpeted with violets and narcissus lady felicia described san marco as a paradise but her friends told her that there was absolutely no society and that she would be bored to death you will meet nobody but invalids dreadful people in bath chairs one of her rich friends told her a purse-proud matron who owned a villa at cannes and considered no other place possible from spezia to marseilles i shall be in a bath chair myself replied lady felicia i want quiet and economy and not society at vera's age it is best that there should be no talk of dances and high jinks mrs montague watson smiled and shrugged her shoulders girls have their own opinions about life nowadays she said i don't think theodore or margaret would put up with san marco although they are still in the schoolroom they want fine clothes and smart carriages to look at when they trudge with their governess vera is more unsophisticated than your girl she will be quite happy reading scott or dickens in a garden by the sea i mean to keep her as fresh as i can till i hand her over to one of her aunts to be brought out she is a sweet dreamy child said mrs watson who became deferential at the mere mention of countesses 
and i dare say she is going to be pretty i have no doubt about that said lady felicia they went to san marco early in november and found the hotel and the sea-front the abode of desolation so far as people went the habitual invalids had not yet arrived and the weather was at its worst the four cosmopolitan shops that spread their trivial wares to tempt the english visitor and which gave a touch of colour and gaiety to the poor little street were not to open till december there were only the shabby little butcher baker and grocer who supplied the wants of the natives vera delighted in the scenery but she found a sense of dullness creeping over her in the midst of all that loveliness of mountain and shore everything seemed deadly still a calm that weighed upon the spirits her grandmother had caught cold on the journey and the english doctor had to be summoned in the morning after their arrival he was their first acquaintance in san marco and was the most popular inhabitant in that quiet settlement old ladies talked of him as chatty and so obliging but objected to him on the ground of two frequent visits which made it perilous to call him in for any small ailment whereby he was sometimes called in too late for an illness which was graver than the patient suspected dr wilmot was essentially a snob but the amiable kind of snob fussy obliging benevolent and with a childlike worship of rank for its own sake he was delighted to find a lady felicia at the hotel des anglais where even a courtesy title was rare and where for the most part a city knight's widow took the pa of all the other inmates dr wilmot told lady felicia that she had chosen the very best spot on the riviera for her bronchial trouble and that the longer she stayed at san marco the better she would like the place the bronchial trouble was mitigated but not conquered and from this time lady felicia claimed all the indulgences of a confirmed invalid while vera's position became that of an assistant nurse subordinate always to granny's devoted maid a sturdy north country woman of eight-and-forty who had been in lady felicia's service from her eighteenth year and who could talk to vera of her mother as she remembered her in those long-ago days before the runaway marriage which was supposed to have broken granny's heart vera had no idea of shirking the duties imposed upon her she walked to the market to buy flowers for lady felicia's sitting-room and she cut and snipped them and petted them to keep them alive for a week she dusted the books and photographs and the priceless morsels of chelsea and dresden china which granny carried about with her and which gave a cachet to the shabby second-floor salon she went on all granny's errands she walked beside her bath chair and read her to sleep in the drowsy windless afternoons when the casements were wide open and the sea looked like a stagnant pond it was a dismal life for a girl on the edge of womanhood a girl who had little to look back upon and nothing to look forward to it seemed to vera sometimes as if she had never lived and as if she were never going to live granny talked of the same things day after day indeed her conversation suggested a talking machine for one always knew what was coming the talk was for the most part a long lament over all the things that had gone amiss in granny's life the follies and mistakes of other people father uncles and aunts husband daughter the wrong-headedness and self-will of others that had meant shipwreck for granny vera listened meekly and could not say much in excuse for the sins of these dead people of whose lives and characters she knew only what granny had told her for a mother she did plead at the risk of offending granny she knew the history of the girl's love for her poet-lover for she had it all in her father's exquisite verse a story-poem in which every phase of that romantic love lived in colour and light vera could feel the young hearts beating as she hung over pages that were to her as sacred as holy writ granny's bronchitis and granny's memories of past wrongs did not make for a cheerfulness and even the loveliness of that italian shore in the celestial light of an italian spring was not enough for the joy of life there is a profound melancholy that comes down upon the soul in the monotony of a beautiful scene where there is nothing besides that scenic beauty a monotony that weighs heavier than ugliness 
a dull street in bloomsbury would have been hardly more oppressive than the afternoon stillness of san marco when granny had fallen asleep in her nest of silken cushions and vera had her one little walk alone up and down up and down the poor scrap of promenade with its scanty row of palms tall and straggling crowned with a spare tuft of leaves and a bunch of dates that never came to maturity companionless and hopeless vera paced the promenade and looked over the tideless sea the only changes in the days were the alternations of granny's health the days when she was better and the days when she was worse and when dr wilmot came twice dreary days on which vera had to go down to the table d'hote alone and to run the gauntlet of all the other visitors who surrounded her in the hall obtrusively sympathetic and wanting to know the fullest particulars of lady felicia's bronchial trouble and what dr wilmot thought of it they told her it must be very dull for her to be always with an invalid and they tried to lure her into the public drawing-room where she might join in a round game or even make a fourth at bridge or if there were a conjurer that evening the elderly widows and spinsters almost insisted upon her stopping to see the performance no thank you i mustn't stay granny wants me she would answer quietly and after she had run upstairs there would be a chorus of disapproval of lady felicia's want of consideration in depriving the sweet child of every little pleasure within her reach vera had no yearning for the gaieties of the hotel drawing-room or the conjurer's entertainment but she had a feeling of hopeless loneliness which even her favourite books could not overcome if she had been free to roam about the olive woods to climb the hills and get nearer the blue sky she might have been almost happy but granny was exacting and vera had never more than an hour's freedom at a time the hills and the rustic shrines that shone dazzling white against the soft blue heaven were impossible for her exploration or adventure was out of the question she might sit in the garden where the pepper trees and palms were dust-laden and shabby or she might pace the promenade where granny and martha lidcott granny's maid could see her from the salon windows on the second floor on the promenade she was safe and needed no chaperone the hardiest and most audacious of prowling cads would not have dared to follow or address her under the glare of all those hotel windows and within sound of shrill female voices and flying tennis balls on the promenade she had all the hotel for her chaperone granny asked her the same questions every evening when she came in to dress for the seven o'clock dinner had she enjoyed her walk and was it not a delicious evening and then granny would tell her what a privilege it was to be young and able to walk instead of being a helpless invalid in a bath chair vera wondered sometimes whether the privilege of youth with the long blank vista of years lying in front of it were an unmixed blessing End of chapter 1chapter two part one of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org beyond these voices by mary elizabeth braddon chapter two part one it was the middle of february and all the little gardens that lay like a fringe along the edge of the olive woods had become one vivid pink with peach blossoms while the dull grey earth under the peach trees was spread with the purple and red of anemones san marco was looking its loveliest blue sea and blue sky cypresses rising up like dark green obelisks among the grey olives and even the hotel garden was made beautiful by roses that hung in garlands from tree to tree and daffodils that made a golden belt round the dusty grass vera went to the dining-room alone at the luncheon hour on this heavenly morning a loneliness to which she was now accustomed as granny's delicate and scanty meal was now served to her habitually in her salon 
fortified by dr wilmot who was an authority at the anglais lady felicia had interviewed the landlord and had insisted upon this amenity without extra charge the hotel seemed in a strange commotion as vera went downstairs chambermaids with brooms and dusters were running up and down the corridor on the first floor doors that were usually shut were all wide open to the soft spring breezes furniture was being carried from one room to another and other furniture that looked new was being brought upstairs from the hall carpets and curtains were being shaken in the garden at the back of the hotel and dust was being blown in through the open window on the landing vera wondered but had not to wonder long for at the luncheon-table everybody was talking about the upheaval and its cause and a torrent of rambling chatter in which widows and spinsters were almost shrill with excitement gradually resolved itself into these plain facts an italian financier signor mario provana the richest man in rome and one of the richest men in london which of course meant a great deal more was bringing his daughter to the hotel a daughter in delicate health sent by her doctors to the most eligible spot along the western ligura the poor dear girl was in a very bad way the old ladies told each other threatened with consumption she had two nurses besides her governess and maid and the whole of the first floor had been taken by signor provana to the annoyance of lady sutherland jones quite the most important inmate of the hotel who had been made to exchange her first-floor bedroom for an apartment on the second floor which signor canincio the landlord declared to be superior in every particular as well as one lira less per diem i should have thought your husband would have hesitated before putting one of his best customers to inconvenience for a party who drops from the skies and may never come here again lady jones complained to the landlord's english wife who was if anything more plausible than her italian husband the holloway builder's widow was uncertain in her aspirates more especially when discomposed by a sense of injury madame canincio pleaded that they could not afford to turn away good fortune in the person of a roman millionaire who took a whole floor and would have all his meals served in his private salle a manger the extra charge for which indulgence would come to almost as much as her ladyship's arrangement for lady sutherland jones albeit supposed to be wealthy was not liberal her late husband had been knighted after the opening by a royal princess of a vast pile of workmen's dwellings paid for by an american philanthropist and neither husband nor wife had achieved that shibboleth of gentility the letter h vera heard all about signor provana and his daughter next morning from dr wilmot who was more elated at the letting of the first floor to that great man than she had ever seen him by any other circumstance in the quiet life of san marco i consider the place made from this hour said the doctor rubbing his well-shaped white hands in a prophetic rapture there will be paragraphs in all the roman papers and it will be my business to see that they get into the new york herald we must boom our pretty little san marco my dear lady felicia your coming here was good luck for we want our english aristocracy to take us up but all over the world mario provana's is a name to conjure with and if his daughter can recover her health here we shall make san marco as big as san remo before we are many years older it was my wife's delicate chest that brought me here and i have been rewarded by the beauty of the place and i think i may venture to say the influential position that i have obtained here he might have added that his villa and garden cost him about half the rent he would have had to pay in san remo or menton while a clever manager like mrs wilmot could make a superior figure in san marco on economical terms how old is the girl lady felicia asked languidly between fifteen and sixteen i believe she will be a nice companion for miss davis i do so hope we may be friends vera said eagerly in a hotel where almost everybody was elderly the idea of a girl-friend was delightful lady felicia who had been very severe in her warnings against hotel acquaintance answered blandly though with a touch of condescension if the girl is really nice and has been well brought up i should see no objections to vera's knowing her 
"Thank you, Granny," cried Vera. "She is sure to be nice." "Signor Provana's daughter cannot fail to be nice," protested the doctor. Lady Felicia was dubious. "An Italian," she said. "She may be precocious, artful, of doubtful morality." "Signor Provana's daughter impossible." nothing happened to stir the stagnant pool of life at san marco during the next day and the day after that vera asked madame cananchio when signor provana and his daughter were expected but could obtain no precise information the rooms were ready madame cananchio showed vera the salon which she had seen in its spacious emptiness with the shabby hotel furniture but to which signor provana's additions had given an air of splendour sofas and easy-chairs had been sent from genoa velvet curtains and portieres bronze lamps and silver candlesticks persian carpets everything that makes for comfort and luxury and the bedroom for the young lady had been even more carefully prepared but beside her own graceful pillared bedstead with its lace mosquito curtains was the narrow bed for the night nurse which gave its sad indication of illness the flowers were ready in the vases filling the salon with perfume i believe they will be here before sunset madame canincio told vera we are waiting for a telegram to order dinner the chef is in an agony of anxiety first impressions go for so much and no doubt signor provana is a gourmet vera heard no more that day but the maid who brought the early breakfast told her that the great man and his daughter had arrived at five o'clock on the previous afternoon vera went through the flower market in a fever of expectation bought her cheap supply of red and purple anemones her poor little bunch of parma violets and branches of mimosa thinking of the luxury of tuberoses and camellias in the provana salon but she thought much more of the sick girl and the father's love exemplified in all that forethought and preparation for youth in vigorous health there is always a melancholy interest in youth that is doomed to die and vera's heart ached with sympathy for the consumptive girl for whom a father's wealth might do everything except spin out the weak thread of life she heard voices in the hotel garden as she went up the sloping carriage drive with her flower basket on her arm and at a bend in the avenue of pepper trees and palms she stopped with a start surprised at the gaiety of the scene which made the shabby hotel garden seem a new place the dusty expanse of scanty grass which passed for a lawn where nothing gayer than aloes and orange trees had flourished was now alive with colour a girl in a smart white cloth frock and a large white hat was sitting in a blue and gold wicker chair a girl all brightness and vitality as it seemed to vera where she had expected to see a languid invalid reclining among a heap of pillows a wasted hand drooping inertly too feeble to hold a book this girl's aspect was of life not of sickness and coming death her eyes were dark as brown large and brilliant with long black lashes that intensified their darkness intensified also by the marked contrast of hair that was almost flaxen parted on her forehead and hanging in a single thick plait that fell below her waist and was tied with a blue ribbon three spaniels one king charles and two blenheims jumped and barked about her chair and increased the colour and gaiety of her surroundings by their frivolous decorations of silver bells and blue ribbons and as if this were not enough of colour gaudy draperies of italian printed cotton were flung upon the unoccupied chairs and covered a wicker table while as the highest note in this scale of colour a superb crimson and green cockatoo with a tail of majestic length screamed and fluttered on his perch and responded not too amiably to the attentions of dr wilmot who was trying to scratch himself into the bird's favour the doctor desisted from his pretty pollyings on perceiving vera ah miss davis that's lucky do stop a minute with granny's flowers i want to introduce you to mademoiselle de provana the d was the embellishment of dr wilmot who could not imagine wealth and importance without nobility but the financier called himself provana to court vera murmured something about being charmed put down her basket on the nearest chair and went eagerly towards the fair girl with the dark lustrous eyes who held out a dazzling white hand smiling delightedly 
i am so glad to find you here dr villemot she stumbled a little over the name otherwise her english was almost perfect dr villemot told me you were english and about my own age and that we ought to be good friends i am so glad you are english i have talked much english with my governess but i want a companion of my own age i have had no girl friend since i left the convent three year ago dr vilmot tell me your father was a poet that is lovely lovely my father is a great man but he is not a poet though he loves dante my little girl is an enthusiast and something of a dreamer said a deep grave voice and a large tall figure came into view suddenly from behind a four-leaved japanese screen that had been placed at the back of the invalid's chair to guard her from an occasional breath of cold wind that testified to the fact that although all things had the glory of june the month was february vera was startled by a voice which seemed different from any other voice she had ever heard so grave so deep with such a tone of solemn music and yet voice and enunciation were quite natural there was nothing to suggest pose or affectation the speaker stood by his daughter's chair an almost alarming figure in that garden of ragged pepper trees shabby palms and sunshine the sun dominating the picture he was considerably over six feet with broad shoulders long arms and large hands very plainly clothed in his iron-gray tweed suit which almost matched his iron-gray hair he was not handsome though he had a commanding brow and his head was splendidly poised on those splendid shoulders vera told herself that he was not aristocratic indeed she feared that there was something almost plebeian in his appearance that might offend granny who having had to do without money was a fierce stickler for race while vera was thinking about him signor provana was talking to his daughter and the voice that had so impressed her at the first hearing became infinitely beautiful as it softened with infinite love what must it be to a girl to be loved so fondly by that great strong man vera had known no such love since her poet father's death she took up her basket of flowers and then lingered shyly not knowing whether she ought to go at once or stay and make conversation but guilia settled the question oh please don't run away she said don't go without making friends with my family let me introduce miss thompson indicating a comfortable light-haired person sitting near her absorbed in sudermann's last novel and look at my three spaniels jane seymour anne boleyn and catherine parr i call them after your wicked king henry's wives i hope you revel in history it is my favourite study she stooped to pat the spaniels who all wanted to clamber on her knees at once even under the full cloth skirt and silk petticoat vera could not help seeing that the knees were sharp and bony by this time she had discovered the too slender form under the pretty white frock and the hectic bloom on the oval cheek she knew the meaning of that settled melancholy in signor provana's dark grey eyes eyes that seemed made rather for command than for softness she caressed the sparkling black and tan anne boleyn and stroked the long silken ears of the blenheims jane and catherine and allowed them to jump on her lap and explore her face with their affectionate tongues jane seymour was the favourite guilia told her the dearest dear a most sensible person and sensitive to a fault vera admired the cockatoo and answered all guilia's questions about san marco and the drives to old mountain towns and villages old watch-towers and old churches drives which vera knew only from the talk of the widows and spinsters who had urged her to persuade granny to hire a carriage and take her to see all the interesting things to be seen in an afternoon's drive granny is not strong enough for long drives vera had told them they smiled significantly at each other when she had gone poor child i'm afraid it's granny's purse that isn't strong enough said the leading light in the little community i believe they're regular church mice for poverty in spite of the airs my lady gives herself said lady jones if it was me and money was an object i wouldn't pretend to be exclusive and waste ten lire a day on a salon 
i don't mind poverty and i don't mind pride but pride and poverty together is more than i can stand the other ladies agreed pride was a vice that could only be allowed where there was wealth to sustain it only one timid spinster objected lady felicia was a disbrow she said meekly and the disbrows are one of the oldest families in england vera had to promise to take tea with the signorina at five o'clock that afternoon before guilia would let her go i am not allowed to put my nose out of doors after tea guilia said not in a complaining tone but with light laughter people are so absurd about me especially this person putting her hand in her father's and smiling up at him just because of my winter cough as if almost everybody has not a winter cough promise arrivederci cara signorina vera promised and this time she was allowed to go mario provana went with her and carried her basket he did not say a word till they had passed beyond the belt of pepper trees that screened the lawn and then he began to walk very slowly and looked earnestly at vera i know you are going to be kind to my girl he said and his low grave voice sounded mournful as a funeral bell dr wilmot has told me of your devotion to your grandmother and how sweet and sympathetic you are you can see how the case stands you can see by how frail a thread i hold the creature who is dearer to me than all this world besides oh but i hope the signorina will gain health and strength at san marco vera answered earnestly she does not look like an invalid and she is so bright and gay she has never known sorrow she is never to know sorrow she is to be happy till her last breath that is my business in life sorrow is never to touch her but i do not deceive myself i have never cheated myself with a moment of hope since i saw death's seal upon her forehead in my dreams sometimes i have seen her saved but in my waking hours never as i have watched her passing stage by stage through the phases of a mortal illness i watched her mother ten years ago through the same stages of the same disease doctors said take her to this place or to that to sicily to tyrol to the engadine to india to the transvaal for four years i was a wanderer upon this earth a wanderer without hope then as i am a wanderer without hope now i have business interests that i dare not utterly neglect because they involve the fortunes of other people i brought my daughter here because i am within easy reach of rome i ought to be in london he had walked with vera beyond the door of the hotel he stopped suddenly and apologized i would not have saddened you by talking of my grief if i did not know that you are full of sympathy for my sweet girl i want you to understand her and to be kind to her and above all to give no indication of fear or regret you expected to find a self-conscious invalid hopeless and helpless with the shadow of death brooding over her and you find a light-hearted girl able to enjoy all that is lovely in a world where she looks forward to a long and happy life that gaiety of heart that high courage and unshaken hope are symptomatic of the fatal malady which killed my wife and which is killing her daughter but is there really really no hope of saving her cried vera with her eyes full of tears there is none all that science can do all that the beauty of the world can do has been done i can do nothing but love her and keep her happy help me to do that miss davis and you will have the heartfelt gratitude of a man to whom fate has been cruel my heart went out to your daughter the moment i saw her vera said with a sob i was interested in her beforehand from what dr wilmot told us but she is so amiable so beautiful one look made me love her i will do all i can all all but it is so little no it is a great deal your youth your sweetness make you the companion she longs for she has friends of her own age in rome but they are girls just entering society self-absorbed frivolous caring for nothing but gaiety i doubt if they have ever added to her happiness she wanted an english friend and if you will be that friend she will give you love for love forgive me for detaining you so long i will call upon lady felicia this afternoon if she will allow me or perhaps i had better wait until she has been so good as to call upon my daughter i know that english ladies are particular about details 
vera dared not say that granny was not particular since she had heard her discuss some trivial lapse of etiquette involving depreciation of her own dignity for the space of an afternoon clever girls who live with grandmothers have to bear these things signor provana carried her basket upstairs for her and only left her on the second floor landing with a thoroughly british shake hands he was the most english foreigner vera had ever met she had to give granny a minute account of all that had happened and granny was particularly amiable and warmly interested in miss provana's charm and mr provana's pathetic affection for his consumptive daughter they are evidently nobodies from a social point of view lady felicia remarked with the pride of a long line of disbrows in the turn of her head towards the open window as if dismissing a subject too unimportant for her consideration but i dare say the man's wealth gives him a kind of position in rome and even in london vera told her that signor provana wished to call upon her but would not venture to do so till she had been so kind as to call upon his daughter this was soothing i see he has not lived in london for nothing she said i will call on miss provana this afternoon you must help to dress me lidcott has no taste on this vera was bold enough to say she had accepted an invitation to take tea with the invalid without waiting to consult granny you did quite right great indulgence must be given to a sick child in that case i will defer my visit till tea-time and we will go together i want to be friendly rather than ceremonious vera was delighted to find granny unusually accommodating and that none of those unreasonable objections and unforeseen scruples to which granny was subject were to interfere with her pleasure in guilia society pleasure must it not be pleasure too closely allied with pain now that she knew the girl she was so ready to love had the fatal sign of early death upon her beauty but at vera's age it is natural to hope even in the face of doom she may improve in this place her health may take a sudden turn for the better god may spare her after all for the poor father's sake at least i know what i have to do to try with all my might to make her happy a footman in a sober but handsome livery was hovering in the corridor when lady felicia arrived supported by vera's arm and by a cane with a long tortoise-shell crook like the baroness bernstein's an amount of support which was rather a matter of state than of necessity lady felicia had put on her favourite velvet gown and point lace collar for the occasion she had always two or three velvet gowns in her wardrobe and declared that genoa velvet was the only wear for high-bred poverty as it looked expensive and never wore out End of chapter two part one chapter two part two of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org beyond these voices by mary elizabeth braddon chapter two part two the footman flung open the tall door of signor canincio's best salon and announced the ladies the provana salon was startling in its afternoon glory the three long windows were open to the sunshine which in most people's rooms would have been excluded at this hour the balcony was full of choice flowers in turquoise and celadon vases from valori the luxury of satin pillows overflowing sofas and armchairs the dresden cups and saucers and silver urn and tea tray the three dogs running about with their ribbons and bells the gaudy cockatoo screaming on his perch guilia's blue silk tea-gown and miss thompson's mauve cashmere all lighted to splendour by the glory of the western sky made a confusion of colour but almost blinded lady felicia 
provana received her with grave courtesy and led her to his daughter's sofa she bent over giulia with an affectionate greeting and then sinking into the arm-chair to which provana led her begged somewhat piteously that the sunshine might be moderated a little a request that provana hastened to obey closing the heavy venetian shutters with his own hands greeley and i are too fond of our sun-bath he said and we are apt to forget that everybody does not like being dazzled i came to san marco for the sun and it is seldom that i get enough but your salon is just a little dazzling and your dogs are more than a little intrusive lady felicia would have liked to add the spaniels having taken a fancy to her tortoise-shell cane and velvet skirt one had jumped upon her lap and the other two were disputing possession of her cane serviceable miss thompson was quick to the rescue carried off the dogs and restored the cane to its place by the visitor's chair while provana brought an olive wood table to lady felicia's elbow and stood ready to bring her teacup i hope you are pleased with san marco said granny not soaring above the normal conversation in the hotel we think it quite delightful so far provana replied and vera noticed that he never expressed an opinion without including his daughter it was always we or giulia and i and there was generally a glance in giulia's direction which emphasized the reference to her i love 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 the place already cried giulia who had beckoned vera to her sofa and was holding her hand most of all because i have found this sweet friend here you will let us be friends won't you cara granny carissima mia murmured her father reprovingly please don't let us be ceremonious in this desert island of a place said lady felicia with a graciousness that was new to vera i like to be called granny and i can be granny to the signorina as well as to this girl of my own flesh and blood you can hardly doubt signor provana that it is pleasant for me to find that my poor vera has now a sweet girl friend in this hotel where we have lived three months and hardly made an acquaintance much less a friend but it has been your own fault granny interposed vera who was essentially truthful people really tried to be kind to us when we were strangers if you mean that some of the people were odiously pushing and officious i cannot contradict you replied the descendant of the disbrows with ineffable scorn but granny was not scornful in her demeanour towards the roman financier to him and to giulia she was granny in her most urbane and sympathetic mood she was charmed to find him so much of an englishman my mother was english to the core of her heart she was the daughter of a colonial merchant whose offices were in mincing lane and his home in lavender sweep i am told there is no such thing as lavender sweep now provana went on regretfully but when i was a boy my grandfather's garden was in the country and there were gardens all about it and fields of lavender said giulia oh do say that there were fields of lavender no the lavender fields had gone far away into kent only the name was left and now there are streets of shabby houses and shops and not a vestige of garden encouraged by lady felicia's urbanity signor provana went on to tell her that he was plebeian on both sides and that all there was of nobility about him belonged to giulia my wife came of one of the noblest families in italy he said and when we want to tease giulia we call her contesina a title to which she has a right but which always makes her angry i don't want to be better than my father giulia cried eagerly if he is not a noble he comes of a line of good and gifted men my grandfather's name is revered in rome and his charitable works remain behind him to show that if he was one of the cleverest roman citizens he had a heart as fine as his brain that is the noblest kind of nobility known a vero granny granny smiled assent and entertained a poor opinion of giulia's intellect a shallow creature spoilt by overmuch indulgence and inclined to presume 
the two girls were sitting in the sun by an open window a long way off they had their own table and miss thompson waited upon them with assiduity granny had been warned that there was to be no doleful talk no thinly disguised pity for the consumptive girl all was to be as bright as the room full of flowers and the untempered sunshine provana told lady felicia that he had ordered a landau from genoa which had arrived that afternoon the horses are strong and used to hill work and there is an extra pair for difficult roads he said greeley and i mean to see everything interesting that can be seen between breakfast and sundown of course we must be indoors before sunset everybody must in this treacherous climate i hope miss davis may be allowed to go with us sometimes indeed often always padre mio always cried guilia from her distant sofa she had begun to listen when her father talked of the carriage vera is to come with us always you will let her come won't you cara granny please don't ask her vera said dutifully that would be deserting granny she likes me to read to her in the afternoon she shall enjoy your hospitality now and then signorina and i will do without my afternoon novel but you would soon tire of her if she were with you often tire of her impossible why i don't even tire of miss thompson guilia said naively please let miss davis come with us whenever you can spare her provana said when he took leave of lady felicia at the foot of the stairs leading to her upper floor you see how charmed my daughter is at having found an english friend and i think you must understand how anxious i am to make her happy lady felicia was all sympathy and placed her granddaughter at the signorina's disposal if this man was of plebeian origin he had a certain personal dignity that impressed her nor was she unaffected by his importance in that mysterious world of which she knew so little the world of boundless wealth when she arrived somewhat breathless in the shabby second-floor salon she sank into her chair with an impatient movement and breathed a fretful sigh think of this great coarse man with his balcony of flowers and four horses to his landau she exclaimed disdainfully these provanas absolutely exude gold oh granny he is not the least bit purse-proud or vulgar vera protested you must see that he has only one desire in life to make his daughter happy and to prolong her life i hope god will be good to that poor father and spare that sweet girl the girl is nice enough and they will make this place pleasant for you extra horses for the hills and i have not been able to afford a one-horse fly it is hard for you granny dear but we have been quite comfortable and you have been better than you were at brighton last year yes i have been better but it is the same story everywhere the same pinching and watching lest the end of the quarter should find me penniless lady felicia resented narrow means as a personal affront from providence signor provana lost no time in returning granny's visit he appeared at three o'clock on the following day bringing his daughter and a basket of flowers that had arrived that morning from genoa the resources of san marco not going beyond carnations roses and anemones i fear you must have found the stairs rather tiring lady felicia said when she had welcomed guilia not a bit i rather like stairs you see i came in my carriage and it was explained that guilia had an invalid chair in which her father and the footman carried her up and down stairs of course i could walk up and down just like other people guilia said lightly but this foolish father of mine won't let me i feel as if i were the princess badrulbador coming from the bath in her palanquin only there is no aladdin to fall in love with me aladdin will come in good time said lady felicia i don't want him i want no one but papa when i was three years old i used to think i should marry papa as soon as i grew up and now i know i can't it makes no difference i don't want anybody else an engagement was made for the next day they were to start at eleven o'clock for the roman amphitheatre near ventimiglia looking at the old churches and palm groves of bordighera on their way 
it would be a long drive but there were no alarming hills lady felicia was invited but was far too much an invalid to accept there was no making a secret of granny's bad health her bronchial trouble was the staple of her conversation and now a new life began for vera a life that would have been all joy but for the shadow that went with them everywhere like a cloud that follows the traveller through a smiling sky that shadow of doom which the victim saw not but which those who loved her could not forget the shadow made a bond of sympathy between mario provana and vera the consciousness of that sad secret never left them and many confidential words and looks drew them closer together in the course of those long days in lovely places Reguilia was always the gayest of the little party and eager in her enjoyment of everything that was beautiful or interesting from a group of peasant children with whom she stopped to talk to the remains of a roman citadel that took her fancy back to the caesars the chief care of father governess and friend was to prevent her doing too much nothing in her own consciousness warned her how soon languor and fatigue followed on exertion and excitement miss thompson was always ready with a supporting arm always tactful in cutting short any little bit of exploration that might tire her charge she was one of those admirable women who seem born to teach and cherish fragile girlhood people almost thought she must have been born middle-aged it was unthinkable that she herself had been young and had required to be taught and cared for she was highly accomplished and the things she knew were known so thoroughly that one might suppose all those dates and dry historical details had been born with her ready pigeon-holed in her brain signor provana treated her with unvarying respect and always referred any doubtful question in history or science to miss thompson but her most valuable gift was a disposition of unvarying placidity nobody had ever seen lucy thompson out of temper the most irritating of pupils had never been able to put her in a passion she stood on one side as it were while a minx misbehaved herself her aloofness was her only reproof and one that was almost always efficacious aguilia provana that placid temper had never been put to the proof aguilia had a sweet nature was quick to learn and had a yearning for knowledge that was pathetic when one thought how brief must be her use for earthly wisdom and what was better she loved her governess miss thompson had a pleasant time in signor provana's household moving from one lovely scene to another or in rome sharing all the pleasures that the most enchanting of cities could afford plays operas concerts races afternoon parties in noble houses from the day his daughter's health began to fail and the appearance of lung trouble made the future full of fear signor provana made up his mind that her life should never be the common lot of invalids however few the years she had to live however inevitable that she was to die in early youth the years that were hers should not be treated as a long illness the horrible monotony of sick rooms should never be hers it should be the business of everybody about her to keep the dark secret of decay her trained nurses were not to be called nurses but maids and were to wear no hospital uniform everything about her was to be gay and fair to look upon a luxury of colour and light and she was to enjoy every amusement that was possible for her without actual risk into that brief life all the best things that earth can give were to be crowded she was to know the cleverest and most agreeable people she was to read the best books to hear the most exquisite music to see the finest pictures the most gifted actors nothing famous or beautiful was to be kept from her from the first note of warning this had been guilia's education and miss thompson's chief duty had been to read the best books of the best writers to an intelligent and sympathetic pupil 
there had been no dull lessons no long exercises in the grammar of various tongues giulia's education after her fifteenth birthday had been literature in the best sense of that sometimes ill-used word signor provana's system had been so far successful that his daughter had lived much longer than the specialists had expected and her girlhood had been utterly happy but the shadow was always in the background of their lives and wherever he went with his idolized child there was always the fear that he might leave her among the flowers and the palm groves that filled her with joyous surprise on their arrival and go back to his workaday life lonely and desolate vera was astonished at the things giulia knew and was sorely ashamed of her own ignorance for the first time in her life she had come into close association with cultivated minds with people whose conversation though without pedantry was full of allusions to books that she had never read and knowledge that she had never heard of to know giulia and her governess was a liberal education and vera showed a quickness in absorbing knowledge that interested her new friends and made them eager to help her the world of poetry lay open and untrodden before this daughter of a poet the idea of her friend's parentage fascinated giulia does she not look like a poet's daughter she asked her father and provana assented with smiling interest all giulia's geese are swans he said but i believe she has found a real swan this time vera's shyness wore off after two or three excursions in that ideal springtime the weather had been exceptionally mild this season and there had been no unkind skies or cruel mistral to gainsay dr wilmot's praise of san marco it might almost seem as if provana had been able to buy sunshine as well as other luxuries day after day the friendly little company of four set out upon some new excursion to spots whose very name seemed a poem to santa croce to dolce aqua to finamarina to cola the little white town among the mountains where there were a church and a picture gallery or by the roman road to the tower of mastachini on a high plateau crowned with fir trees with its view over sea and shore valley and wood and far-off horizon a place for a picnic luncheon and an afternoon of delicious idleness to vera such days were unspeakably sweet could it be strange that she loved the girl who had begun by loving her and who was her first girl friend if she was not so impulsive as giulia she was as sensitive and as sympathetic and giulia's sad history had interested her before they met as friendship ripened in the familiarity of daily companionship her interest in giulia's father grew stronger day by day his devotion to his daughter was the most beautiful thing she had ever known he was the first man with whom she had ever lived in easy intimacy for the uncles by blood or by marriage in whose houses she had been a visitor had always held her at arm's length and her shyness had been increased by their coldness the only creature of that superior sex with whom she had ever been at her ease was her young cousin claude rutherford he had been kind to her and with him she had been happy but that friendship was of a long time ago ages and ages it seemed to her when she conjured up a vision of delicious days in the park hair-breadth escapes in claude's dinghy and thrilling rides on his arabian pony vera noticed that signor provana did not often join in the animated conversation which giulia and her governess kept up untiringly during their morning drives he was silent for the most part and always meditative his dark grey eyes seemed to be seeing things that were far away you see papa sitting opposite us cara said giulia but you must not think he is really with us he is in london or in paris negotiating a loan that may mean war he has to provide the sinews of war sometimes and i tell him he is responsible for the lives of men his thoughts are a thousand miles away and he doesn't hear a word of our foolish talk non e vero padre 
he looked at her with his fond parental smile i hear something like the songs of birds he said and it helps me to think go on talking anima mia i like the sound if i miss the sense i have been telling vera about browning she knows nothing of browning though she is a poet's daughter is not that dreadful i have had only granny's books and she does not think there has been an english poet since byron we are birds of passage and granny has only her poor little travelling library but it has always seemed to me that byron and my father were enough i have never wearied of their poetry oh but we shall widen your horizon said guilia you shall read all my books and you must lend me your father's poems i shall be very glad if you will read some of my favourites all all when i admire i am insatiable guilia was generally silent on their homeward journeys wearied by the day's pleasure in spite of the watchful care that had spared her every exertion when the carriage had to stop at the foot of some grassy hill at the top of which they were to take their picnic luncheon or from which some vaunted view was to be seen provana would take his daughter in his arms and carry her up the slope and once when vera watched him coming slowly down such a hill with a tender form held by one strong arm and the fair head nestling on his shoulder she was reminded of that divine figure of the shepherd carrying a lamb the pathetic symbol of superhuman love her eyes filled with tears as she looked at him holding the frail girl with such tender solicitude walking with such care and in the homeward drive when guilia was reclining among her pillows with closed eyes vera saw the profound melancholy in the father's face and realized the effort and agony of every day in which he had to maintain an appearance of cheerfulness these pilgrimages to exquisite scenes under a smiling sky were to him a kind of martyrdom knowing all that lay before him counting the hours that remained before the inevitable parting vera knew what was coming dr wilmot had told her that the inn could not be far off the most famous physician in rome had come to san marco one afternoon passing through on his way to a patient at nice provana had told his daughter and coming casually to take his luncheon at the hotel and the great man had confirmed wilmot's worst augury the end was near but even after this guilia rallied and the picnics in romantic places were gayer than ever though dr wilmot went with them armed with restoratives for his patient and pretending to be frivolous it was on the morning after a jaunt that had seemed especially delightful to guilia that lidcott came into vera's room with a dismal countenance yet a sort of lugubrious satisfaction in being the first to impart melancholy news i'm afraid it's all over with your poor young friend miss she was taken suddenly bad at ten o'clock last night with an hemorrhage dr wilmot was here all night i saw the day nurse for a minute just now as she was taking up her own breakfast tray they're always short-handed in this house seen your canincio being that mean and the nurse says her young lady's a little better this morning but she'll never leave her bed again she's quite sensible and she doesn't think she's dangerously ill even now and all her thought is to prevent her father worrying about her worrying nurse says he sits near her bedroom door with his face hidden in his hands listening and waiting as still as if he were made of stone would they let me see her vera asked i think not miss she's to be kept very quiet and not to be allowed to speak vera went down to the corridor directly she was dressed and sat there near the salon doors waiting patiently on the chance of seeing one of the nurses or miss thompson she would not thrust herself upon signor provana's sorrow even by so much as an inquiry or a message but she liked to wait at his door to be near if guilia wanted her they had been like sisters in these few weeks that seemed so long a space in her life and she felt as if she were losing a sister 
she had been sitting there nearly an hour when signor provana came out with a packet of letters for the post he had been obliged to answer the business letters of the morning the machinery of his life could not be stopped for an hour for any reason not even if his only child were dying there was a look in his face that froze vera's heart what the nurse had said of him was true he was like a man turned to stone he took no notice of vera he did not see her though he passed close to her as he went downstairs to post his letters a matter too important to be trusted to a servant vera was standing at the end of the corridor when he came back and this time he saw her and stopped to speak ah miss davis the hour i have foreseen for a long time has come i have thought of it every day of my life and i have dreamt of it a hundred times but the reality is worse than my worst dream he was passing her and turned back we dare not let her speak every breath is precious to-day she must see no one but her nurse not even me but if she should be a shade better to-morrow will you come to her i know she will want to see you i will come at any hour night or day i hope you know how dearly i love her vera answered and then broke down completely and sobbed aloud when she recovered her face provana was gone and she went slowly back to the upper floor where granny was waiting for her to sympathize with her indignation at certain offensive or supposed to be offensive remarks in the letters of a sister-in-law a niece and a dear friend but indeed dear granny that could not be meant unkindly urged vera for this offender was her favourite aunt lady oakhampton who had been kind to her not meant what could it mean but a sneer at my poverty i know aunt mildred wouldn't knowingly wound you don't contradict vera i know my nephew's wife a snob to the tip of her nails she feels sure san marco must be just the place for us so pretty and so quiet and so inexpensive she dared not say cheap and she does not wonder that i have stayed longer than i talked about staying when i left london lady felicia had remained in the dull hotel des anglais six weeks beyond her original idea six weeks longer than the london doctor had insisted upon she had stayed into the celestial light of an italian april to the delight of vera who had thus enjoyed a new life with her new friend she was not frivolous in her attachments or ready to fall in love with new faces but in sober truth she had never before had the chance of such a friendship a girl of her own age highly cultivated attractive and sympathetically eager to give her the affection of a sister it would have been too cruel if granny's predetermination to leave italy in the first week of march had cut short that lovely friendship happily granny had found out that march in london might be more perilous for her bronchial tubes than december and had made a good bargain with the rapacious canincio since several of his spinsters and widows were leaving him it was the third day after guilia's fatal attack that miss thompson came to the upper floor to summon vera to the sick-room the dear child has been pining to see you ever since yesterday morning when she rallied a little she has written your name on her slate again and again but the doctor was afraid she would excite herself and perhaps try to talk she has promised to be quite calm and not to speak and you must be very very quiet dear and make no fuss you can just sit by her bedside for a little while and hold her hand but above all you must not cry any agitation might be fatal is there no hope no hope vera asked piteously no my dear it is a question of hours guilia's room was so full of flowers that it looked already like a chapelle ardente sinking slowly surely down into the darkness of the grave she was still surrounded with brightness and beauty 
windows and shutters were open to the sky and the sun and the blue plain of the sea showed far away melting into the purple horizon her three dogs were on the bed jane seymour nestling against her arm the other two lying at her feet they were transformed creatures no impetuous barking or restless jumping about the wistful eyes gazed at the face they loved the silken ears drooped over the silken coverlet the fringed paws lay still the dogs knew Wheelie gazed at her friend with those two brilliant eyes and touched her lips with a pale and wasted hand as a sign that she must not speak and then she wrote on her slate eagerly i have wanted to see you so long so long and now this may be the last time i did not know i was so ill but i know now oh who will care take of my father when he is old who will love him as i have done i thought i should always be there always his dearest friend you must be his friend vera he will be fond of you for my sake you will find my place by and by never darling no one can fill your place vera said in a quiet voice full of calm tenderness a strange suppressed sound half sigh half sob startled her and looking at the window she saw signor provana sitting on the balcony motionless and watchful again guilia's tremulous hand wrote don't go till they send you away sit by me and let me look at you oh what happy days we have had among the lovely hills you will think of me in years to come when you are in italy always always i shall think of you and remember you wherever i am and now i won't talk any more but i will stay till miss thompson takes me away miss thompson came very soon and vera bent over the dying girl and kissed the cold brow arriva dolci carissima i shall come again when miss thompson fetches me she left the bedside with that word of hope the luminous eyes following her to the door the dogs did not stir nor the figure in the balcony miss thompson and the nurse sat silent and motionless a stillness so intense seemed strange in a sunlit room gay with flowers it was late next morning when vera fell into a troubled sleep filled with cruel dreams dreams that mocked her with visions of guilia well and joyous in one of those romantic scenes where they had been happy together in hours that were so bright that vera had forgotten the shadow that followed them lidcott came with the morning tea and there was a letter on the tray from the foreign gentleman said lidcott who had never attempted signor provana's name vera tore open the envelope and looked wonderingly at the page where nothing in the strong stern penmanship indicated sorrow and agitation my girl is at rest he wrote she knew very little acute suffering only three days and nights of weariness she gave me her good-bye kiss after three o'clock this morning and the light faded out of the eyes that have been my guiding stars to make her happy is what i have lived for since i knew that i was to lose her on this side of my grave if prayer could reverse the omnipotence decree mine would have been the mortal disease and i should have gone down to death leaving her in this beautiful world lovely and full of life you have been very kind and have helped me to make these last weeks happy for her i shall never forget you and never cease to feel grateful for your sweetness and sympathy when she knew that she was dying she begged me to lay her at rest in this place where she had been so happy those were the words she wrote upon her slate when she was dying her last words the last effort of her ebbing life and i shall obey her you will go with us to the cemetery to-morrow morning i hope though you are not of our church End of chapter two